Hi friends again. Now uh, we will start with the next new topic radiation heat transfer. In the past uh, two three lectures we were looking at uh, the concepts of conduction heat transfer. We derived the heat conduction equation and applied it to various one dimensional situations steady state and transient. So that is to basically give you a, a brief idea. The conduction heat transfer is the simplest of the mechanisms of heat transfer and uh, we understood the basics of steady state and transient conduction in uh, the previous three hours of lecture. Today we will start with the uh, mechanism of uh, heat transfer which is less familiar to the common student who has completed the class 12 that is the radiation heat transfer. See all of us have a brief idea what uh, radiation heat transfer actually involves. It actually involves transmission of energy in the absence of a material medium and we all know that uh, we receive uh, energy from the sun which is basically the lifeline of uh, all life on planet earth through radiation because there is empty space between the sun and the earth and uh, the energy that we receive from the sun travels all this distance at the speed of light and arrives at the surface of the earth and that is what sustains all kinds of life on earth. Now in order to understand radiation heat transfer one needs to go back to what we understand about electromagnetic radiation. All of us have studied electromagnetic radiation so we know that electromagnetic radiation has uh, one characteristic that it travels at the speed of light and uh, the speed of light is constant is an absolute constant universal constant when it is written for travel through vacuum approximately 2.998 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. And we also know that if we look at any other medium then the speed of light through that medium has a ratio of its refractive index with uh, the speed of light and vacuum. So we can write that as uh, C0 by C is n where uh, is the n is the refractive index of any medium that you are looking at in which the velocity of the electromagnetic radiation is C and C0 is the, is the velocity of electromagnetic radiation in vacuum. So this number is always greater than 1 or let us say greater than or equal to 1, equal to 1 for vacuum and greater than 1 for uh, most material media because the light travels or electromagnetic radiation travels slower through other media as compared to uh, vacuum. So for glass for example, this value would be about 1.5. this value would be about 1.5 for water this would be about 1.33 and so on. So which basically means that uh, the light travels about one and a half times slower through glass as compared to that through vacuum and 1.33 times slower through water as, it comp as compared to what it travels through vacuum. So this is something that we all remember. The next thing that we remember is that every electromagnetic radiation has its wavelength lambda and the units can be in units of length let us say meter and uh, it also has a frequency nu so if I look at uh, a radiation let us say a transverse wave that goes like this the wavelength is the length between every wave that is the length of the every wave it has a rising and a falling pattern. Okay, so this is let us say your lambda 
and uh, the frequency is number of such waves that actually happens in one meter of length or rather could, the number of waves that actually get transmitted in one second. So the product of these two, lambda into nu, lambda is this length and nu is the number of such waves that goes through in one second. So this basically gives you C. Okay. So this is the relationship that you have. So you have an inverse relationship if uh, lambda is large because the C is going to be a constant. Uh, let us say if it is for vacuum then it is C naught then nu lambda would be C naught. So nu would be C naught by lambda or lambda is equal to C naught by nu. So these two have an inverse relationship with each other that is when lambda is large nu would be small and uh, lambda is small nu would be large that is the thing that you have. We have also learned Okay, so this comes from the electromagnetic theory. From the quantum theory, this nu is known to be associated with the energy that is carried by the wave. So we know that uh, the energy that is carried by the wave is uh, h nu. Okay, so if I explain the energy in the form of photons, so a photon emitted at frequency nu would carry an energy equal to h nu, where h is the Planck's constant. Now we are moving away from the convective heat transfer coefficient here. H is not a convective heat transfer coefficient, but it is a Planck's constant. H is the Planck's constant. And it has a value of 6.6260. Let me write it here. 6.62609. 10 to the power of minus 34 joules per second. So this is the value of uh, the Planck's constant. So each photon carries an amount of energy this is equal to this h multiplied by the frequency. Okay. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of the wave, lower the frequency, lower the energy, which will basically mean that using this relationship, the higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength and lower the energy the longer the wavelength this is something that we know okay so so this is your revision of what you had as basics in uh, electromagnetic radiation now talking about electromagnetic radiations you have the entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiations let us uh, look at this in the form of uh, wavelength lambda okay now wavelength lambda can go from very very small uh, wavelengths to very very large wavelengths okay so let's uh, look at the typical spectrum of um, electromagnetic radiation so the typical spectrum of electromagnetic radiation would have um, let's say at this lower end 10 to the power of minus 7 meters Okay, so 10 to the power minus 7 micrometers rather, rather than meters. Okay, so 1 micrometer is 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. Okay, so the more convenient uh, unit that is used for wavelength is micrometers because uh, that is the unit in which the wavelengths that we normally look at in electromagnetic theory or electromagnetic uh, radiation study makes sense to us, otherwise, the number becomes very small or very large. So micrometer they are looking at. So let us say 10 to the power of minus 7 micrometers and below. So very, very high energy uh, waves are the cosmic rays. Okay. In the range between 10 to the power of minus 5 to 10 to the power of minus 7. Okay. So lambda in micrometers here. 10 to the power of minus 7 to 10 to the power of minus 5 to 10 to the power of minus 7. You get the gamma rays. And uh, in fact, the gamma rays uh, go all the way from 10 to the power minus 4. Okay. And uh, in the range of 10 to the power of minus 2 to 10 to the power of minus 5, so it, let's say 10 to the power of minus 2 here. So in the range of 10 to the power of minus 2 to minus 5, you have the X rays. So these are all very high energy uh, waves, so they have very short uh, wavelength. 
um, let us say here 10 to the power of minus 1 to let us say 10 to the power of 2 is the range which normally is a thermal radiation which is the region that we will be uh, looking at. We will understand why this region is called a thermal radiation. Of course, this is a very important region because it contains the visible uh, uh, spectrum which the human eye can sense in this region anywhere between 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 micrometers. So, that is in the range of 10 to the power of uh, minus 1. So, 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 is your uh, visible region. Okay. Shorter than that here you will have the ultraviolet region and longer that, that here in this region is the infrared which is the region that uh, could participate. So, the sh near ultraviolet, visible and the infrared together span what is called the thermal uh, radiation. Okay. And after this you have the microwaves. electrical engineers, communication engineers should be familiar with this. So, microwaves go from 10 to the power of 2 to 10 to the power of 5 uh, micrometers, right. So, ten to the power of 5 micrometers is 10 to the power of minus 1 meters, right. That is 10 centimeters. That is the range of micrometers. 10 to the power of 2 micrometers is a 10 to the power of 2 micrometers, 10 to the power of 5 micrometers is the microwaves and beyond that is the radio waves, okay. the radio waves and TV waves and then after that you have the electrical power waves and so on. So, you actually have the spectrum going from 10 to the power of minus infinity to 10 to the power of plus infinity. That is the range of uh, uh, wavelengths that you might want to look at. But out of all of this uh, electromagnetic radiation, the region that is going to be relevant to thermal radiation is a very, very small region, 3 decades, 10 to the power of minus 1 to 10 to the power of 2 micrometers, right. So, that is the region where you get thermal radiation happening. So, now let us try to understand what is this uh, thermal radiation and how does it uh, get associated with this wavelength. So, suppose you have let us say a piece of iron at room temperature, it does not emit its own light. So, you cannot see any light that any radiation that it emits. In fact, all objects above the absolute zero temperature are known to emit electromagnetic radiation. So, your uh, piece of iron that you are looking at which is at room temperature let us say 30 degrees Celsius is also emitting radiation, but you cannot see it because your eyes are not sensitive to the wavelength that it might be emitting. So, it might be emitting somewhere in the larger wavelength region which is uh, which, sorry larger wavelength region in the infrared region. Okay. So, that is the region in which it might be emitting. So, it is not visible to you. So, you start heating it. You put it in a, uh, an oven and start heating it or for example, a tower on which you make chapati. If you put it on the gas and start heating it, after some time when the, the tawa gets warmer, if you put your hand a few centimeters above the tower, do not touch it, you will burn your hands. Put your hand a few centimeters above the tower, you will already feel the energy being emitted by the tower because your hand feels the warmth of the tower by radiation. Okay. You still, if the lights are off, for example, the tower is still invisible. The tower is not visible in the dark because its temperature is still too low. But if you take this piece of iron that we talked about and put it in a furnace and heat it to something like 300, 400 degrees Celsius, then when you take it out of the furnace, even if the lights are off, it is still visible in the light with a dull red color. right? So, basically means that at that temperature, it has started emitting somewhere in the border of your visible region. So, some visible radiation is being emitted by this object. You heat it further to a much higher temperature, let us say 1000 degrees Celsius, 1100 degrees Celsius, 1200 degrees Celsius, close to its melting point which is about, uh, it depends on what steel it is. If it is uh, pure iron, it melts at about 1500 degrees Celsius, 
if it is alloyed steel it can melt at about 15 or 11 50 degrees celsius 1200 degrees celsius depending on the kind of alloy it is okay so suppose let us say this is not melted but it is hot at about 1100 degrees celsius so now at this temperature the piece appears really nearly white because it's actually emitting in the entire spectrum of your visible region from violet to red so violet is in the range of 0.4 and red is in the range of 0.6 to 0.7 so when the temperatures are close to about uh, 350 to 400 degrees celsius it starts emitting at this end and by the time uh, it's about 1100 degrees celsius okay but in kelvin if you would like this will become something like 700 kelvin uh, yeah say 650 to 700 kelvin okay and uh, here it becomes something like 1400 kelvin so from a temperature of about 700 to 1400 kelvin you see that the piece of iron actually spans through the range of visible uh, radiation uh, wavelengths so it goes from something like 0.4 to 0.7 if you further heat it it can go to the uh, emissions the emissions can include the ultraviolet uh, regions as well and uh, if you look at one of the hottest objects that you commonly have seen it's the sun the surface of the sun uh, can be estimated to be emitting at about 5800 kelvin that is the kind of temperature that is estimated so at that temperature bulk of the radiation is emitted in the visible region some of the radiation about 12 percent of the radiation comes in the uv region the ultraviolet and a large amount of its energy comes in the infrared region okay so it emits typically about 40 percent of the energy in the visible region about 12 percent in the ultraviolet and the remainder in the infrared that's the uh, proportions of uh, solar radiation and that is an emitter estimated to be at this temperature at the surface right so you can see that all phenomena that are related to heat and the realistic temperatures are falling within the range of uh, anywhere between uh, 0.1 micrometer to at most about 10 micrometers or 100 micrometers in the work, uh, longest case so that is the uh, wavelength range which is uh, typical of thermal radiation so we will actually be talking about thermal radiation heat transfer so when we talk about thermal radiation heat transfer we understand that we are looking at 0.1 to 100 micrometers of wavelength this is the region that we are trying to look at and we will not be concerned of the electromagnetic radiation which is below or above this range so you can see that in the range of 10 to the power of minus infinity to 10 to the power of plus infinity uh, micrometers of wavelength we are only looking at 10 to the power of minus 1 to 10 to the power of 2 which is three decades okay out of the infinite number of or double infinite number of uh, uh, 10 to the 10 power exponents of uh, wave wavelength range we are basically looking at only a minuscule region which is 0 0.1 to 100 micrometer range so that is what is covered in the thermal radiation heat transfer and you can understand because the direct correlation with the coloration of a hot uh, piece of metal is going to correlate with the ki kind of radiation or kind of wavelength in which it is emitting the radiation right so this is uh, one uh, thing that we need to bear in mind that thermal radiation is a minuscule fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum it is not any significant fraction but it's a very small fra uh, fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum between 10 to the power of minus 1 and 10 to the power of 2 micrometers which is 10 to the power of uh, minus 7 to 10 to the power of minus 4 meters of wavelength so that is the wavelength range that we are looking at and the corresponding frequencies can be worked out from your value of c naught which is 2.998 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second so this is the speed at which uh, light travels through vacuum one of the interesting characteristics about uh, radiation heat transfer is that it can go from a source to a target without affecting things that are there in between provided the things that are there in between 
do not absorb or emit the energy that is going. Say for example, the energy from the sun is coming and reaching the surface of the earth and the surface of the earth, suppose you keep some uh, substance, or so let us say a metallic plate which is directly exposed to the sunshine, you find that its temperature can go up to something like 40, 45, 50 degrees Celsius easily. Right? This can happen irrespective of the fact that the atmosphere through which the solar radiation is coming is at minus 50, minus 60, minus 80, minus 100 degrees Celsius at greater elevations. Right? So you have material medium in between and the material medium is at a much lower temperature but still the target piece where the radiation is reaching can reach temperatures much higher than that. This is another example. The other example is uh, the solar collectors. So solar collectors, what do they have? They have a plate, okay, which is uh, blackened. This is made black because black color is known to absorb all the emission that is going to come on it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And you have a box inside which that black surface is covered so that the atmospheric air cannot go and cool this plate. And on the back of it, you have insulation. Okay, And on this plate, you have water pipes that go which collect the water and heat it and this hot water then goes to a tank. Okay, The cold water is supplied from here, hot water goes to a tank. This is typically a solar uh, thermal collector. In this particular case, the glass wall that is here, if I insulate all of this and I put a double glazing here so that and there is uh, insulating a gap, air gap in between the two layers of glass then what happens? <coughs> this plate can reach temperatures of about 70 to 80 degrees Celsius without the piece of glass that is here going too much above the atmospheric temperature. It might just be around atmospheric temperature or maybe if it is absorbing some amount of energy because of the solar energy, this can go to about 30, 40 degrees Celsius. But <coughs> this surface on which the energy is being uh, uh, made, to made to be incident can reach temperatures of about 70, 80 degrees Celsius. Even better, if I have a parabolic trough kind of, kind of collector where the solar energy comes and gets reflected to the focal point and at the focal point, I put a pipe, the temperature of this pipe can reach 300 degrees Celsius with absolutely no difficulties irrespective of the fact that all the surrounding regions where through which the radiation is coming, it's the radiation that is carrying all that energy but it does not heat anything in between but it directly heats this and it gets to about that kind of temperature. So this is one interesting feature of radiation that um, it can go from one source to another target completely ignoring that uh, the things that are there in between provided that the material uh, medium that is there in between has no properties to absorb radiation in the wavelength and frequency through okay, in which it is transmitted through that medium. Okay. So that is another thing we will need to understand when and how this interaction will happen. We will talk about it a little later. But right now, so this is one of the interesting properties that radiation can come from the sun and reach the solar collector without heating anything else in between at all. So that is a property of uh, radiation. Okay. So now we understood thermal radiation and uh, we understood uh, how uh, the thermal radiation uh, is transmitted. Now the second thing that the next thing that I wanted to talk about is volumetric versus surface phenomena okay so we know that um, when a particular uh, medium let us say atmosphere which is primarily constituted by diatomic gases does not absorb or emit the radiation which is in the range of wavelengths that the solar energy carries because the electronic transitions that happen in these materials are in an energy range which is well outside this uh, this range of uh, energy which in which the sun is emitting this this range of wavelengths in which the sun is emitting and therefore this medium is practically transparent to solar radiation and all the solar radiation that comes from the sun 
will reach the surface of the earth with very little being absorbed. What is that very little? You have an ozone layer and ozone has the property of absorption in the UV band. Okay, So the ultraviolet which is between 0.1 and 0.4 micrometers interacts with this ozone and gets absorbed in that ozone to convert that ozone into oxygen and uh, in that process the UV light, UV part of the energy which is about 12 percent of the solar energy is absorbed in the uh, stratosphere where the ozone is uh, present and so the solar energy that comes to the earth's surface is quite benign to our skin otherwise the ultraviolet can cause a lot of difficulties skin cancers is one of the issues it can also cause other uh, burns and injuries to uh, uh, life form on earth uh, we all know that um, your uh, water purifier uses an ultraviolet uh, light in order to kill microorganisms that are present in water which basically means that if the solar radiation sunshine the, the sunshine's ultraviolet reach the ground then practically all the micro uh, microbial life form that exists in the way would have been killed right in order to sustain the microbial life form which actually sustains a lot of life on earth you need to have this ozone prevented there not just to save humankind from uh, skin cancers but also to protect uh, microbial life forms from uh, com becoming completely extinct in the uh, places where the sun is uh, shining. So with that 12% uh, of uh, the sunshine get absorbed by ozone. Right? Similarly the carbon dioxide and water vapor that are present in small quantities really trace quantities carbon dioxide is normally present in parts per million what is a typical uh, uh, amount of carbon dioxide that is present. The global warming the uh, theory says this should be kept under 400 ppm in order for the earth to uh, survive catastrophe due to climate change. Right? So that is the kind of concentrations of CO2 that are typically present in the atmosphere. And water vapor, we studied psychrometry. The kind of water vapor carried in the atmosphere is in a few grams per kg, right? anywhere between 10 to 25, 30 grams per kg is the quantity. So this is in something like 0.1% to 0.5% kind of um, quantity. So those quantities of CO2 and H2O have the ability to absorb the infrared radiation. Okay? And that is the reason for global warming. So the more the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more would be the absorption of infrared and retention of the infrared because the sunshine otherwise reaches the earth's, earth's surface, heats the surface and the surface again radiates. But the surface radiates because of its lower temperatures, it radiates in the infrared region. This radiation is completely trapped by the CO2 and H2O and you get what is called the greenhouse effect. Okay. So the greenhouse effect happens because the infrared radiation from the surface of the earth back to the space is pro protected and is prevented and absorbed by the CO2 and H2O that is there in the atmosphere getting the circuit temperatures of the atmospheric air higher and thus resulting in global warming. Right? So that is a greenhouse effect. The other greenhouse effect is this one, this glass sheet is completely transparent to the visible and UV light that goes through it but completely opaque to the infrared radiation that comes from the plate because the plate is at uh, temperatures of about 70-80 degrees Celsius and whatever comes out from the plate is completely blocked by the glass so the energy stays inside and gets the temperature of the plate higher and higher. So that is another greenhouse effect which we are using to our positive uh, uh, use and the negative use is the heating up of the atmospheric air. Right? We also must have uh, studied about or uh, learned about solar cookers okay. or you, have must have, uh, you must have heard about vacuum tube collectors So these are examples of uh, the positive utilization of uh, greenhouse effect. 
In solar cookers, normally you have a box which has a glass cover on top and uh, you put food articles to be heated here and this is blackened the surface and it is insulated on the outside and you have a double glazed uh, cover. So the so sunshine um, the sunshine enters this and gets trapped because the emissions from these vessels and from the uh, walls of the solar collector are in the infrared region which cannot cross this glass and so it will stay there and the temperatures of uh, the food can reach temperatures that can reach boiling points of water and therefore this can be kept close to boiling points of water for a uh, long time and that will result in the cooking of the uh, things to be uh, cooked there the food items vegetables rice uh, lentils dal they can be cooked easily in solar cookers in this fashion this is the solar cooker the vacuum tube solar collector is something which i talked to you about in the previous slide where um, we talked about this parabolic trough uh, reflectors where the light is reflected onto a pipe and what is this pipe like the pipe would have a metallic pipe which is blackened and uh, this will be metallic pipe typically made of uh, copper or any such good conductor inside which water is flowing and that will get heated by it and there will be a concentric glass tube which is uh, evacuated so here it is vacuum okay so you have this long pipe and surrounded by a large glass tube and the ends of the glass tube are closed and sealed and the water can uh, go in and uh, come out through the inner tube the other tube is evacuated so this uh, kind of a tube is what is kept at the focal point of uh, this device and therefore the temperatures can reach up to 300 degrees celsius here because the greenhouse effect inside this tube prevents the radiation from this uh, tube from crossing this glass and going out so that is the reason uh, there is glass here so glass has a very good property the property is that it is completely transparent to visible and ultraviolet uh, radiation but it is completely opaque to infrared radiation and therefore can be used for making greenhouses greenhouse farming is something which is very common in uh, temperate countries even in uh, places like delhi in winter if you want to cultivate things which are uh, going to grow only in higher temperatures then you can use greenhouse farms inside which it can be done so those are the positive uses of greenhouse effect so now with both of this we understand a few uh, things that radiation is a volumetric phenomenon in media that participate in the radiation so what are the participating media that we discussed in this one we looked at atmospheric air in which o2 n2 do not participate in radiation in the range of wavelength that we looked at but we said h2o co2 they participate in um, trapping the infrared radiation and O3 which uh, participates by trapping the ultraviolet radiation. So if the medium contains a gas whose electronic transitions are in the range of the wavelengths of the transmitted radiation then part of it would be absorbed by part of it or the whole of it depending on the depth of the medium the radiation would be absorbed by the medium and if those things can be neglected or they are in small quantities then the transmission happens so the incoming solar radiation the uv is trapped here the rest of it these things or even these things do nothing to them so they come in but the reflected radiation the energy that it goes back from the earth the reflected radiation also is similar to the original one so it goes out uh, these things don't block this may block the uv but it is at the higher altitude so that's what happens to the reflected solar radiation but the emitted solar radiation the earth gets warmer and it, it re-emits that is in the infrared region because the temperatures are much smaller and these gases absorb it 
and therefore the part of the thing is retained and it is good and that's why we are able to sustain life on the planet earth because it keeps a nice blanket of uh, air whose mean annual temperature is like 15 degrees celsius so we can live on it comfortably but if that goes up by a few degrees the mean annual temperature if from 15 degrees if it goes to 17 degrees then it causes catastrophic results so that's the uh, uh, thing that uh, the global warming uh, theory actually talks about and we need to try and avoid the catastrophic results of global warming by controlling the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so this is one part of it so that is the volumetric phenomenon that we talked about the other thing that we want to talk about is the surface phenomenon Okay, so let us uh, try to uh, understand these. If I look at, let us say, a metal sheet. Okay, so the metal sheet is very shiny, and it reflects most of the energy that uh, gets incident on it, most of the uh, light that gets incident on it. Why is that happening? Because it's an opaque substance. So, whatever energy that is incident on the surface may not penetrate beyond at most a few microns, a few atomic thicknesses or maybe at most a few microns into the layer. So, the rest of the volume does not even know that there is solar radiation at the surface. Right? So, whatever comes here gets reflected and that goes away or so working, whether it, if something is absorbed or reflected happens in the top layer of it and after that through conduction maybe the uh, rest of the body might get heated but the radiation itself does not penetrate beyond the surface. Right? Similarly um, all opaque substances the uh, radiation actually then becomes a surface phenomenon. It is a surface that participates in receiving the radiation, absorbing it, reflecting it, uh, scattering it, whatever it does it is all happening at the surface, it is not happening in the volume then it becomes a surface phenomenon. So, in transparent media where the energy can be transmitted through it can become a volumetric uh, phenomenon uh, and if the volume contains substances that have electronic or uh, molecular transitions that happen in the wavelength range or in the energy range of the wavelength in, of the energy that is passing through in the energy, energy range of the electromagnetic radiation that is passing through it then it gets absorbed attenuated, scattered or re-emitted, but if uh, those are not present then it gets completely transmitted. So that way it is a volumetric phenomenon, but if it is an opaque substance then it does not go into the volume at all from the surface itself it is reflected or transmitted so it becomes a surface phenomenon. So in transparent substances it is a volumetric phenomenon, in the opaque substances it is a surface phenomenon. That is the next thing that we need to understand. The third thing that we need to understand is uh, how much energy does a surface emit and uh, how is it related to temperature. Okay? So that brings us to the definition of uh, something called a black body. Okay? What is a black body? It is defined as a perfect emitter. and a perfect absorber. Okay. So this is an ideal which can never be really achieved but it can be approached. So this is an ideal. So what is a perfect absorber? Let us first understand for perfect absorber. Perfect emitter is a little bit more uh, involved. So we will talk about perfect absorber. So if I have a black surface, a surface which is going to qualify as a black body, then any radiation that is incident on it from any direction and in any wavelength will be absorbed by it. Okay? All the radiation that is incident on this surface will be absorbed and nothing will be reflected. Okay? No reflection. All the incident radiation will be absorbed. Then it is a perfect absorber. So this is easy to understand. So if I have a surface on which energy is coming from any direction. So I am talking about direction and wavelength. So 
so all directions and wavelengths the radiation coming onto the surface will be completely absorbed and there will be no reflection so that is a perfect absorber a perfect emitter means that a black body when it is kept up at a particular temperature t emits the amount of radiation which is the maximum possible by a surface which is at that temperature okay so this is something which again depends on um, fundamental physics so the theory for how much energy can be emitted at maximum by any given surface at a temperature t is given by uh, quantum physics so uh, planck had uh, given that uh, theory and uh, even before that by uh, uh, experimental observations the uh, amount of energy emitted was given so we'll talk about both of them so one is what we call as the black body emissive power black body emissive power we call it as eb which is the amount of energy emitted by radiation by a black body which is at a given temperature t per unit area okay so this is emission per unit area of a black body okay emission this is energy emission okay per unit area per unit time so the units will be in watts per meter square this is the units of it and this was given as uh, proportional to fourth power of temperature and uh, given by sigma times t to the power of 4 where sigma is what we call as a stefan boltzmann constant so experimentally uh, stefan uh, said that it's uh, at a proportional to the fourth power of temperature and uh, sigma he evaluated and boltzmann from uh, the theory was able to corroborate and verify the value so this sigma is called the stefan boltzmann constant and this has a value of 5.67 into 10 to the power of minus 8 watts per meter square kelvin to the power of 4 that is a unit here okay and uh, this law that eb is equal to sigma t to the power of 4 is called the stefan boltzmann law so this is one thing which was experimentally found but a theoretical basis for this came from uh, max uh, for from uh, planck so uh, planck's equation for uh, defining electromagnetic radiation emitted at any wavelength okay so he gave an expression for eb lambda which is black body emission emitted at any wavelength lambda uh, which is a function of both lambda and uh, t as c1 divided by uh, lambda to the power of 5 multiplied by exponent of c2 by lambda t minus 1 okay uh, the units for this is uh, watts per meter square micrometer okay so this is the energy emitted so this is basically nothing but uh, deb by d lambda at lambda so this is the expression okay now where c1 and c2 are given in terms of uh, other constants that are known c1 is um, 2 pi h c not square okay and uh, c2 is uh, h c not by k 
where h we know is the Planck's constant, c naught is the speed of light through vacuum and k is the Boltzmann constant. Okay. So, uh, this Boltzmann constant is nothing but the universal gas constant divided by the Avogadro number. So, this is uh, something which is universal gas constant divided by Avogadro number. Okay, so that's your Boltzmann constant. So this value will be something like uh, three point seven four one double seven into ten to the power of minus eight. Oh, sorry, to the power of plus eight. Sorry, to the power of eight. So it will be more like this here. To the power of eight. Uh, so the units will be watts per micrometer to the power of 4, sorry watts micrometer to the power of 4 divided by meter square. So that is the unit of this and uh, the second value will be 1.438 Seven eight into ten to the power of four micrometer Kelvin. Okay, I'm going too much to the edge. Let me write it as well. Micrometer Kelvin. Right. So that's this is your. Uh, uh, Planck's law, this expression is the Planck's law which expresses um, the spectral emissive power. So what we said here is the total emissive power. So total black body emissive power is Eb and the spectral black body emissive power okay. So this is given like this. So this can be plotted. This is a plot that you must all be familiar with. So suppose I plot as a function of lambda. I plot E B lambda. Okay. So you get a curve which goes like this at some value of temperature. Okay. And if I increase the temperature, it goes like that and higher and higher. Okay. And this peak at which the uh, maximum of uh, this happens obeys the Wien's displacement law, which says lambda max times t is equal to a constant. This is equal to 2398 micrometer Kelvin for all these points. Okay. So, and um, as temperature increases, the maximum energy, hmm, the maximum energy that is contained in um, the electromagnetic spectrum also increases. So, at any wavelength, if I uh, draw an ordinate at any wavelength, at a given temperature, uh, if this is the amount of energy that is uh, emitted, the, if the temperature is increased, the quantity of energy that is emitted per unit area goes on increasing at that wavelength. Okay. So that is the true with practically all the wavelengths. And this um, law which uh, correlates the lambda max and T is called the Wien's displacement law. Okay. So now uh, the black body spectrum is characterized by these laws. The Stefan Boltzmann law which gives the total energy emitted per unit area of a black body okay. and uh, the Planck's law that gives you the emission at every wavelength when the surface is kept at a, a certain temperature T. Now if this is integrated over the spectrum, okay, so E B lambda D lambda 
if I integrate from lambda equal to 0 to infinity, I should get a b. Okay. So, if I go back and uh, integrate this expression from lambda equal to 0 to infinity, then I should get sigma t to the power of 4. Okay. So, that is primarily your um, uh, relationship. Okay. So, you can uh, try to do that and verify it for yourself. This is the uh, expression. Okay. So, we can um, express the maximum amount of energy that can be emitted by any surface at any given temperature can be uh, it can be given by uh, the Planck's law for spectral emiss emission that is at every lambda and by the uh, Stephen Boltzmann law for the total emission. Right? So, this is the characteristic of the black body. So, black body being a perfect emitter means it emits the maximum amount of energy possible by a given surface when it is maintained at a certain temperature. So, that is what we call as the black body radiation and uh, any other body suppose I have a surface of the table okay, in which you okay, sit in your class the, okay, the, the desks and the, the chairs those surfaces also emit a certain amount of radiation when they are kept at a certain temperature but that energy will be smaller as compared to the black body. So, suppose I say I keep the black body at uh, room temperature and it emits this kind of radiation. So, this is T is equal to let us say 298 Kelvin which is 25 degrees Celsius. This is the black body spectrum. I compare it with uh, for example, the glass sheet on um, my office desk. Then the glass sheet might have a spectrum which looks like this, this and this. So, it has a few peaks at which it emits, the rest of the regions it emits 0. So, I can actually define the fraction of black body radiation that is actually emitted by a given surface at any given wavelength. So, if I say E lambda, which is the energy emitted, emissive power of any surface, normal surface at wavelength lambda, okay, divided by E b lambda, which is the amount of energy emitted or the emission emissive power of black body at the same wavelength and uh, temperature. This ratio can be defined as what we call as epsilon lambda which is called the emissivity and because it is a function of lambda it is called the spectral emissivity S P E C T. spectral emissivity of that surface. Okay. So, the spectral emissivity is a function of lambda and at different uh, lambda it has different uh, values and it also is a property of the substance, the electronic transitions that happen in that material. So, instead of a glass surface, suppose I take water at 298 Kelvin, it will have a different spectrum. Okay. And this plot of E lambda versus lambda is called the spectrum In this case, because we are plotting about emissions, it is called the emission spectrum of that substance uh, because it is a function of lambda. Okay. So, and the ratio of the okay, emission of a particular body at lambda divided by that by black body at the same lambda and uh, same temperature is called the emissivity. This is a property of the surface and it will vary. Now, if I uh, could look at the total integrated quantity at all wavelengths. So, I can integrate this by integrating E lambda uh, in the same way as I do E b lambda. If I say E is equal to integral of E lambda d lambda from lambda is equal to 0 to infinity, then this is the total emissive power of the real surface and E b is the total emissive power of the black body. The ratio of these two is called the total emissivity. Okay. So, we will call epsilon which is the total emissivity which is E by E b which is nothing but integral from 0 to infinity of E lambda d lambda divided by integral from 0 to infinity of E lambda b d lambda. Okay. So, this is what we call as 
epsilon which is the total emissivity so what is this this is the amount of energy that is emitted by a real surface in comparison with that of a black body so we can say e is nothing but epsilon times integral of e lambda b d lambda from 0 to infinity okay it is also known that this is equal to integral of epsilon lambda e lambda b d lambda from 0 to infinity so that defines your epsilon right so this is basically the definition of uh, epsilon so epsilon will be integral of epsilon lambda e lambda b d lambda divided by integral of e lambda b d lambda so so that's weighted by the perfect appropriate black body emissions okay so this is the expression that we write for the emissivity now the black body function is something like this if i call f 0 to lambda t is nothing but an integral of from 0 to lambda uh, of e lambda b at uh, t d lambda divided by integral from 0 to infinity of e lambda b at uh, t d lambda so this fraction is basically going to come from a particular curve at temperature t okay so if i take any wavelength lambda then this integral the top one will basically be this area and this integral will be the area under the entire curve so this is only a function of this curve and this curve is a function of lambda t so this function what is called the black body function which is the fraction of the total black body emission that happens from lambda equal to 0 to a particular lambda this is a standard value or a standard function because this is defined by the Planck's law okay so this can be integrated and tabulated so you have the f of 0 to lambda t uh, tabulated as a function of lambda t for lambda t equal to 0 to whatever value that is relevant the peak of this uh, value uh, actually the e itself peaks at lambda t equal to 2300 and something so f lambda t corresponding to uh, 2398 uh, like a micrometer kelvin will correspond to the fraction which is from the uh, left end up to the peak okay so that is uh, thing and this uh, spectrum curve is actually available in uh, any heat transfer textbook i can show you uh, uh, one of those uh, representative figures in another slide okay so that uh, basically is used in order to for example evaluate the integrals of uh, this kind where if uh, this epsilon for example or epsilon lambda can be given like a stepwise function so if epsilon lambda versus lambda has values like this and so on where over certain ranges of wavelengths let us say from lambda 1 to lambda 2 it has a value of let us say epsilon 1 and from lambda 3 to lambda 4 it has a value of epsilon 2 and between lambda 4 and lambda 5 it has a value of epsilon 3 and so on so then if i know uh, since this epsilon lambda is a constant at each of these regions that can be taken out of the integral and if i know the radiation integral from let us say lambda 1 to lambda 2 then i'll be able to calculate this more easily and that is calculated using this because i know this fraction from 0 to lambda so if i want lambda 1 to lambda 2 then i can calculate lambda 1 t 0 to lambda 1 t and 0 to lambda 2 t the fractions and this let us say f2 and this is f1 then f2 minus f1 f2 minus f1 gives me the fraction of the total spectrum that is emitted between 
lambda 1 and lambda 2 okay so this fraction uh, from the left to here is f2 and this fraction from the left to here is f1 so that the difference between the two is nothing but the integral from lambda 1 to lambda 2 of e lambda b d lambda which is what we will need here so that multiplied by the respective epsilons can give me the calculation for the total emissivity okay similarly if i know that uh, uh, the sun is emitting let us say at as a like black body at 5800 kelvin i would like to find out what fraction of that energy is in the visible region i know that visible region uh, has a region uh, has a value of lambda varying from lambda is equal to 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 so i can calculate uh, the temperature of the source is 5800 kelvin so lambda 1t is 0 0.4 into 5800 and lambda 2t is 0 0.7 into 5800 so between these two lambdas i can find out so if i can find the fraction between this 0 to lambda 1 t as f1 and 0 to lambda 2 t as f2 then f2 minus f1 gives me the fraction of the solar energy that is actually available in the uh, visible region and uh, f1 gives me the fraction of the solar energy that is at uh, wavelength below 0.4 which is in the uh, ultraviolet region and uh, 1 minus f2 is the fraction of the solar energy that is in the region above 0.7 which is in the ir region so f2 minus f1 gives me the fraction of the solar energy in the visible region 1 minus f2 gives me the fraction of solar energy in the infrared region and f1 gives me the fraction of solar energy in the uv region so these are the uses of this black body spectrum function we use this function to calculate this kind of uh, fractures okay. so we'll stop here at this uh, point and uh, come back to uh, the uh, thermal radiation heat transfer the other concepts that are required to understand thermal radiation and calculate thermal radiation in the next lecture okay so we'll uh, close this talk at this point and uh, resume again in the next lecture I have uploaded uh, the material corresponding to this from Chengal and Ghajar in your uh, Moodle page and I also upload uh, short uh, uh, notes that I have prepared by hand uh, along with the blackboard work as usual in your uh, impartus page so you can take a look at that. Okay. We will stop here and uh, resume it in the next class. Thank you. See you.